The first one here, what you're looking at is you're looking at the bright line spectrum. It tells you of two elements, and you're going to pick from the elements that are here. A bright line spectrum is when the electrons in an excited atom return back to lower levels and give off energy. And when that energy is bent, we get these bands of light. It's like a fingerprint. We need to match the lines here with two of the elements up here. Now, when you're doing this, you'll notice that, and this is done in my opinion on purpose by New York State, that they're not lining up. And they're not lining up, so it makes it more difficult for you to decide which ones match and which ones don't. Just go line by line, moving left to right. This first line is just to the left of 700. The only one here in these four that's to the left of 700 is element Z. Element Z also has a line that looks to be about between 660 and 670. And do we have that on here? Yes. It's this second of these two. It's hard for me to draw it in there, but that one, that's there. Now we have one that is between 580 and 590, and that's this one. Then we have one that's right on 470, this one, and 470 is that one. And then the last one's right at 450, right at 450. Now I'm making marks because the ones that are left are the ones that this one we accounted for are part of a different element. If I go ahead and I just change the color, make it a little easier to see. The first line is here. We have one there, one there, one there, and one there. That's left. So four lines. Right away, it can't be element D. It only has two. And it really can't be element X either. It has to be element A. And those four lines you're going to see are going to match up. In other words, it's a mixture of choice two, A, and Z. For question 32, we're looking for an electron configuration of sulfur in the excited state. Two things. Well, let's make it three. First is they do not give you the symbol for sulfur. You need to look it up on reference table S. If you forget, it is the letter S. Next thing, we're going to go to the periodic table. The periodic table has all of the electron configurations for the elements in the ground state. We can compare it. We have to have the same number of electrons as we would in the excited state, except that it's not going to match the ground state electron configuration on the periodic table. Let's check that out. We find sulfur. Sulfur is element 16 and the electron configuration of 2-8-6 is for the ground state. I'm going to rewrite that information right on the test, and we'll figure it out. Sulfur, 2, 8, and 6. Now, we're looking for the excited state. This is ground state. It can't be choice one. A lot of students might make that mistake. We're dealing with a total of 16 electrons for sulfur. If we go to choice two, we do have 16 electrons here. 2 plus 7 is 9, plus another 7 is 16. That looks to be our answer, which is choice 2. Just rounding it out and looking at 3 and 4, it can't be choice 3, too many electrons. That would be 17. That's not sulfur. And for the last one, again, it would add up to 17, too many. Let's go to 33. Which notations represent atoms that have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. These are known as isotopes. This is one of isotopes of several words you need to know the vocabulary of. And of course, you need to know that these are isotopes, even though they're not using the word isotope. If it has the same number of protons, you're talking about the same element. That's what gives an element its identity. It cannot be then choice four. I'm looking for a different number of neutrons. That's going to be your mass number. Protons and neutrons give an atom its mass. Oh, and by the way, can't be choice one either because it's H and HE. Well, we're down to choice two for sulfur and choice three for chlorine. Can't be choice two. These are not isotopes. 
they would actually be the same mass number or the same number of neutrons. We're looking for different neutrons, and there it is, choice three. Question 34, we're looking at the chemical name of the compound, NH4SCN. You have here two polyatomic ions. Now, you might not know that at first. Maybe you're thinking it might be an organic compound, but if you go to the reference table and you start looking at the organic reference tables, you're not going to find especially sulfur with any of the organic compound material that we have on the reference table, which means we're really dealing with here an ionic and covalently bonded compound. Hopefully you already recognize NH4 as ammonium. It is a poly uh, atomic ion, but maybe you don't. The other place you definitely want to look is the polyatomic ion table. Let's go there. We are dealing with NH4, which is ammonium, and it was SCN, which is thiocyanate. We just put those words in, and we have our compound. Don't get creative. Don't make it up. Check out the reference tape. Once again, it was a little tricky. You might have thought organic compounds because of carbon, but you go there, you don't find the sulfur. Not to say that sulfur can be in an organic compound, but it's not on the reference tables. Check out reference table E before you get creative, and sure enough, there it is. Ammonium thiocyanate was choice one. All right, we are checking out question 35. Which equation represents a conservation of atoms? What they're asking you is, hey, which of these equations is balanced? Well, that means that all of the different atoms of the elements on the reactant side have to be equal to all of the atoms of the different elements on the product side. If we just go through them, we have two irons on the left for number one. We have two on the right. We have two times two, which is four oxygens. We only have three on the right. Cannot be choice one. For choice two, I have two irons on the left and two on the right. As far as oxygens, I have three times two, which is six on the left, but I only have three on the right. It can't be choice two. If I go down to choice three, I have four irons on the left. Two times two is four on the right. I have two times two, which is four oxygens on the left. I have two times three, which is six on the right. It cannot be choice three. Well, the only thing left, of course, is choice four. Let me get rid of everything, and let's take a look. Four irons on the left. Two times two is four irons on the right. Three times two is six oxygens on the left. Two times three, six oxygens on the right. It is choice four. Going on to 36, which compound has covalent bonds? Your covalent bonds are going to be your non-metal to non-metal bonds. It, the only choice it could be here is choice one. Choice two, you have lithium and oxygen. You have metal, non-metal, ionic. Choice three, sodium and oxygen, metal, non-metal, ionic. And choice four, potassium and oxygen, metal, non-metal, ionic. Choice one is the answer. Moving on to 37. Now, for question 37, this is New York State trying to trick you because you're asked which particle diagram that your dots represents a sample of oxygen gas at STP. What you have to remember is oxygen alone is a diatomic molecule. While one filled in dot is going to represent one atom of oxygen, oxygen gas is two atoms. Those are my two dots. Not so good. In other words, it's got to be choice four. You have your diatomic molecules, and of course, they're spaced far apart. For question 38, at which temperature and pressure will a sample of neon gas behave most like an ideal gas? Well, any gas is going to behave most like an ideal gas when you have high temperature and low pressure. Let's just take one at a time. If we want high temperature, 500K is higher than 300K. So let's knock out choices one and two. And we want low pressure. 
that's going to be two atmospheres versus four, so the answer is choice three. Again, high temperature, low pressure. For 39, what is the molarity of two liters of an aqueous solution that contains a half a mole of potassium iodide? Molarity is a solution uh, concentration. We need the solution equation. It is listed on reference table T. You're going to find it there as molarity is equal to moles of solute over liters of solution. We're going to just plug in here. We're going to take 0.5 moles and we're going to divide by 2 liters and always put it in your calculator. The answer here is going to be choice 3. For question 40, we have four gaseous samples and they're all at the same temperature and pressure. When you're asked about containing the same number of molecules then, you're looking for the same volumes. That's going to be sample 1 at 44 liters and sample 3. 1 and 3 is choice 2. We have 10 more questions to go in part B1 of the August 2000 19 regions exam and here we are at question 41 hydrochloric acid reacts faster with powdered zinc than an equal mass of zinc strips right and it says because the surface area of the powdered zinc obviously it's going to increase the number of particle collisions because they're going to have more contact with one another that's your answer done let's go to 42 all right, with 42 here, we're given an equation. We have a system at equilibrium. Remember, equilibrium means the rate of the forward reaction is going to be equal to the rate of the reverse. We're increasing the temperature of the system, and what is it going to cause? Well, this is Le Chatelier's principle. You stress out the system, you're going to have a shift to relieve that stress. Increasing the temperature is going to favor the endothermic direction. Notice energy here. Is written as a product we're going to increase the energy by increasing the energy the shift is going to be towards the HI so that is going to cause the concentration of HI to increase which is choice one now going through the other ones H2 is not going to increase in fact it would decrease both H2 and I2 would decrease HI definitely is not remaining constant because we anytime you mess around with temperature there's going to be a change in equilibrium, and the H2 is not going to remain constant. So for 42, your answer is 1. For 43, it says based on reference table I. So they gave us a break. We know we have to check that out. Which equation represents a reaction with the greatest difference between potential energies of the products and the potential energy of the reactants? The greatest difference is going to be the highest delta H value. All we need to do is scope out the, these four equations on reference table I, and we'll have the answer. Okay, on reference table I, I circled the four reactions, which were the four, four choices here with the question. And you'll notice of all of the delta H values, the highest one is the one here with the aluminum. Let's go back and double check. The answer then for 43 is choice one. All right, for 44, it's asking which phase change results in, in the greatest amount of, or greatest increase in entropy. Entropy is the amount of disorder or randomness. Now, let me show you something. Taking a look at question 44, we're looking for which phase change results in an increase in entropy. When you have a substance going from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, this direction is an increase in entropy. The opposite is a decrease. Another way you can look at it are just take the phase changes for the four different choices, draw the arrows, and you're going to know which one is your end. For example, for choice one, you have iodine going from a gas directly to a solid. Well, that's going to decrease in disorder known as entropy. Um, I'm sorry, decrease in disorder known as entropy. For choice two, you're going from a gas to a liquid. That is also going to have more order, less disorder, so less entropy. For choice three, 
liquid to a gas, and finally choice four, liquid to a solid. Now, if we take a look at my arrows, we have three arrows going to the left and only one going to the right. That is choice three, and lo and behold, that is our answer. Going from a liquid to a gas increases in disorder. Question 45, you see in front of you a compound that's got lots of carbons and hydrogens. You have an organic compound. There are three, yes, three reference tables for organic chemistry on the Regents reference tables. You're looking for the name of this compound. You don't just have carbons and hydrogens. You also have two oxygens. That is going to easily narrow down what this compound is and how we're going to name it. Let's go look at the reference tables to find our two oxygen containing compounds and we'll be able to take it from there. We are looking at reference table R. We are looking for two oxygen atoms. So far as you're moving down the table, let's keep going all the way. It turns out your organic acids and your esters have two oxygen atoms. Now with the acids, you see that the oxygens are coming on the end of the molecule and you have an oxygen bonded to an H. For esters, you have the two oxygens and then you have the, this oxygen here bonded to carbon. This format is going to be the one that we want. The acid format doesn't match what you're seeing on the, um, on the test. We have methyl here because of one carbon, and we have pro on this end where the C double bond O is for the three carbon. And the O8 tells me I have an ester. Let's go back and apply this to the question. With question 45, take a look. Here is this CH3, and then we have four carbons on this side. Reference table R shows you three carbons. This is four. This is an ester. Now, right away from that, you don't even really have to go any further. The answer has to be choice one. The O8 tells me it's an ester. It is not an ether. That's only one oxygen. It's not pentanone. That's one oxygen. Or pentanoic acid because we have the carbon with the three hydrogens, not just hydrogen. Once you recognize that using reference table R, the answer is fairly easy to see. On to 46. Question 46, you're given a balanced reaction, and you're told during the reaction each element changes in. Well, let's just run through the choices. Atomic number, that's your number of protons that gives an element its identity. I'm starting with calcium, and I'm ending with calcium. I'm starting with oxygen, and I'm ending with oxygen. This is not a nuclear reaction. This is a chemical reaction. Atomic number can't be the answer. That means number of protons can't be the answer as well. Number of neutrons. When it comes to a reaction, if the neutrons were changing, then you would see mass numbers as part of the equation. That's not the case here. They're not changing as well. It's got to be oxidation number. Now let's go back and take a look at why that's the case. Anytime you have an element alone, we assign that element an oxidation number of zero and that would include the diatomics, meaning it hasn't lost or gained or shared electrons. But when I have a bond, in this case a metal, non-metal, an ionic bond, calcium is giving away for every atom two electrons, and oxygen is gaining two for every atom. So we do have a change in oxidation number. On to 47. Which equation represents a spontaneous reaction. You are looking at four equations where the spectator ions have been taken out. We are looking at redox reactions. The oxidation numbers are changing. What we need to look at is reference table J. Whatever is higher on reference table J has to be an atom of an element and the ion below. Why do I say that? Well, here I have all metals. Metals, you know, want to give away electrons. 
whatever metal is higher on reference table J has to be in the atom form. In other words, an oxidation number of zero, and the one below has to be in ion form. It's just looking it up on the table. Let's go over there and check it out. The first reaction on the test was calcium and barium. Calcium with an oxidation number of zero and barium in the ion form. But barium is more active than calcium. In other words, barium wants to lose electrons more. For choice one, it's already barium as an ion, which means it's already lost its electrons. So it can't be choice one. Let me flip back. Let's take a look at choice two. For choice two, we're looking at cobalt and zinc. And we want to make sure that cobalt is higher and is in the atom form. Let's check it out. Just like before, here's cobalt. Here's zinc. Zinc is higher on the table. It's going to want to lose electrons more. And it's showing up as a reaction with zinc 2 plus and cobalt. That means that reaction is not spontaneous. We got to keep going. We're flipping back to choice three. Choice three, we're looking at now iron and magnesium ions. Iron must be higher than magnesium in order for iron to give away its electrons. Let's take a look. Here's iron and here's magnesium. Once again, magnesium is higher. It already has given away its electrons. That's not going to work. Of course, it's going to be choice four. Let's go back, get the combination, and double check with reference table. Manganese and nickel. We want manganese to be higher than nickel, because then manganese is going to want to lose the electrons, and the nickel ions are going to have to take them. Let's check it out. Sure enough, that is the correct combo. I have my manganese, and I have my nickel. Nickel is lower. Nickel as an ion, manganese is going to give those two electrons to nickel. So the answer there was choice four. We are getting close to the very end, folks. For question 48, a neutralization reaction is where an acid and a base neutralize one another. They form a salt and water. Water is one of your products that's easy to see. That's H2O. H2O we have in choice three. H2O we have in choice two. Can't be choice one, and it can't be choice four. The next thing is it's got to be an acid and a base. This equation in number two is a combustion reaction, can't be the answer. The answer has to be choice three. Now, there are reference tables that list common acids and list common bases. If you're not sure, double check H2SO4 is an acid and CaOH2 is a base. There's our answer, choice three. For 49, which radioisotope requires long-term storage as a method of disposal to protect living things from radiation exposure over time. Another way to rephrase this is which one of these four radioisotopes has a long half-life? We don't have to guess here. All we need to do is go to the reference tables and find the half-lives for these four. Let's do it. You are looking at reference table N. These are selected radioisotopes, and I've circled the half-lives. Iron, 53, francium, 220, and phosphorus, 32, are way too short when you compare it to plutonium, 239, that has a half-life that is years. There's your answer. 49, the answer is choice one. One more left, folks. Question 50, and we're done with the multiple choice for the August 2000. 19 regions exam. All right, you're given a reaction. As soon as you see mass numbers at the top, that's these numbers, like 235 and 1 and 140, and you see atomic numbers below, you have a nuclear reaction. In this case, you're talking about a fission reaction. I have one neutron going in, I have a split, and I have three coming out. And lo and behold, I have energy. Not just energy, but lots of energy. Well, how did that happen? That happened with choice three. That there's a little bit of mass lost, but it converts into a ton of energy. This is, of course, 
the famous equation E is equal to MC squared. Not that you need to know it for the regions, but it's always good to know. So fission and fusion reactions, you're going to have mass lost, which is going to go ahead and convert to a ton of energy.